coming since the last of the three the third lectures and today it will conclude the series and tell us about the mysteries of the real baby right uh uh yeah so uh, so uh yesterday people complained that there was no twister stuff uh so let's try that today so today will someone be able to twister p1 uh but to alienate people let me again start with a periodic story um uh because uh i'm confused if i don't first recall the periodic story um <clears throat> so periodically, uh, what we what happens was somewhat critical in this kind of geometrization of the local language correspondence periodically was that there was this uh, stack bound G of G bonds on the five point ten curve, <clears throat> and then there was this open substack of like fiberwise trivial bundles, like of the, of the trivial G torses, and this was actually just a classifying stack for for st classifying stack for this. Um, locally profiled group G of QP, um, right where, so, so, so this is a moduli space of G bundles uh, on the Parkman 10 curve. Um, and so let me recall a few uh, properties of the far content curve. Um, <clears throat> so, so I will think about its incarnation as a scheme. So this is some Dedekind scheme over QP. So, so it's locally, it's just a spectrum of a principal ideal domain. Um, it's not at all of finite type because uh, there's some kind of distinguished point. Uh, which has residue field CP, it's a closed point. So all the, all the closed points have as residue fields uh, a complete algebraically closed extension of QP. <clears throat> there for a moment, it was an open question whether it's the, all of them are CP, but then uh, um, it was realized that some, some are even bigger than CP. Um, uh, but although the residue fields are, are very large, the global sections uh, on the far content of the structure sheet are just QP. So some are locally, it's geometric, but globally, it still sees the arithmetic of QP. So it's only QP gives, element of QP gives global functions. Um, and so uh, this in particular is critical for seeing that the automorphisms of the trivial G torso, they are just like G of QP, right? I mean, at each point it would be some large group like G of CP, some more algebraic group, but the only globally defined ones are just this G of QP, which is behind uh, this here being a subspace. Mm. Ah, there was one other thing I want to recall about the theory of vector bundles on the far content curve. <clears throat> uh, so if you look at the vector bundles on the far content curve, then <clears throat> these are all uh, direct sums, non-canonically, but they are all direct sums of stable bundles. Uh, and the stable bundles uh, <clears throat> are completely classified by the slope, uh, which can be any rational lambda number. And so to any lambda there, there, there corresponds some stable vector bundle O of lambda, whose rank is the denominator uh, of lambda. <laughs> and uh, this also like has some consequence for like the stack bun G. So if you look at the stack bun G and like look at just things up to isomorphism, this turns out to be just a countable set of points. So basically, this, the stack has some kind of Harnad and Zimmern filtration uh, certification, and each stratum 
just a point. Uh, and this is something that's well known in some of the theory of uh, reductive groups of a periodic field. This is the so called Kotwitz set B of G. Uh, the Kotwitz set of isocrystals with G structure. And so, so we want uh, some analog uh, of this kind of picture. So now, now the real picture. Um, so there we want to have something similar. So we somehow want to have uh, the classifying stack of G of R now. Maybe, maybe in the sense of yesterday, really. So like when G of R is incarnated as this real analytic group. Um, and we would probably again want to have that sitting as the open substack of trivial G torses. I mean, fiber was trivial G torses. Um, inside the stack uh, bar G, which should be some moduli space. Of G bundles. Well, on the very real analog of the far content curve. And uh, then there have been extremely many indications that this real analog of the far content curve should be this twister P1 uh, that I will uh, define more precisely in just a second. All right, so let's do that. So where is the... Oops, surprise. Uh, um, right, so what is this twist topic one? <clears throat> um, I use a slightly funny notation. I don't have good notation for it. Um, this is uh, uh, the non-split real form of, of P1. Um, so if you want, it's a, it's a broad severity variety. Uh, for the quaternions. So it's an algebraic variety over the real numbers. Yeah, so just like uh, the Falkman 10 curve, it's somehow defined already over this local field that we started with. Uh, but all the residue fields, I mean, it's non-split, right? So it doesn't have any real points. So all the residue fields, are complete algebraic closed extensions of the reals. Uh, but unfortunately, and this is a source of e all evil, uh, the gelfand mazur theorem tells us that only the complex numbers are allowed. Um, right, you don't have larger complete algebraic closed extensions. Um, and so, like, periodically, there was a big difference between QP and CP, and they are very easy to tell apart. The real numbers and the complex numbers is just such a tiny difference that it's very hard to tell apart. Um, Bad. Uh, all right, but uh, still the global sections are just the real. So in particular, we still have that the automorphisms of the trivial G torsor. I mean, it's just on a point. I mean, this is just G of R. So that that is good. That somehow fits into what we want there. Um, let's also quickly talk about uh, the vector bundles and. Let me like also put it here as above. So if you look at the vector bundles on this twist of P1, um, then it's again true that they are, I mean, just more or less like for a uh, projective line, they're all direct sums of stable bundles. Uh, and the stable bundles are co again completely classified by the slope. Um, but this time the slope can at most be a half integer. And basically that's because like uh, QP has finite extensions of any degree, but the real numbers only have extensions of degree two. And so you cannot make the slope uh, like have larger denominator. Um, and so a lambda again corresponds to some 
line bundle or rank two bundle of lambda. And somewhere related to this, you can again also uh, classify um, the G torsors on this P1. And so again, if you look at the G bundles on the twist of P1 up to isomorphism, um, this is some countable set. And, and this is less well known than this uh, Kotwitz stuff about isocrystals in the Peter case. Uh, Kotwitz actually defined in a paper from 2014, uh, he extended his definition of B of G uh, from non Archimedean local fields also to Archimedean local fields as so real numbers. And this is precisely uh, what comes out here. So this is another indication that this uh, twist of P1 is maybe the right thing to look at. He also defined it for global fields, uh, so also for Q. Uh, and that part is still mysterious. Um, right. So uh, for the Park von Tenkov, I mentioned that I'm kind of treating it as being now equipped with a distinguished point, and I actually want to do the same thing here. I do want to fix inside of this twister P1 a distinguished point. Um, in the Park von Tenkov setting, one can later on this like get rid of this choice and also here one could at some point get rid of this choice, but it's confusing to have this extra variable in the picture, so let me fix it. <clears throat> um, is there something else I wanted to say? Right, okay. Um, so is that good? Um, So, right. Uh, ah, so another indication, right, this is what I want to say. So another indication that the twist of P1 may be something uh, interesting to look at is that, uh, as I indicated in the first lecture, the Falk von Ten curve, it wasn't originally defined for purposes in local language, but rather it was defined because it arises naturally in Pierre de Koch theory. And so in particular, these like families of G bundles of the Falk von Ten curve are closely related to variations of Pierre de Koch structure. <clears throat> and so one would naturally expect that whatever the picture is that one wants over the real numbers, it should also be related to variations of Hodge structures. But then uh, Simpson somehow found a way that one way to think about variations of Hodge structure is, is in terms of this twister P1, in terms of what he uh, calls and variations of twister structure, uh, which is another indication that this twister P1 may be the right thing to, to put there as the analog of the Falcon 10 curve. Uh, I should say, however, that it's still a bit of the mystery to me where the twist of P1 comes from. Like in the Pierdex story, one has, a, I think, a very good understanding what the far content curve is, where it comes from. In the story over the real numbers, I'm just putting it in by hand. Uh, I don't know where it comes from. All right. Um, good. So, so okay, so... This is, is some of the rough picture, but now we want to make, like which precise moduli space are we trying to look at there? So we really, uh, what we want to see is that the classifying space for G of R as a locally analytic group. And maybe let me also specify the point. So the point is really again the analytic spectrum of the complex numbers, again with your favorite choice of gaseous or liquid. Uh, ring structure, it doesn't matter. Um, uh, we want this to sit inside as an open sub-stack uh, inside of the stack bungee. So in particular, uh, like if you hope that, if you hope that the formalism, like the thing I always hope that, that the formalism I'm developing with Dustin Clausen of analytic stacks will, would eventually be helpful here. And so the, the hope is somewhat that you can realize this picture now uh, that these objects should be, uh, these should be, live in the category of analytic stacks of a C. <clears throat> this one definitely does, but this already indicates us what kind of structure we've been looking for, uh, what kind of thing this bungee should be. It should be some analytic stack of a, of a C. And so then if we want to define it, we should define for analytic rings over the complex numbers, we should define what, what the values are. 
and maybe we don't really have to define it for all, but for a sufficiently large class of analytic rings over C, Analytic rings A over C, we should we should figure out what the A-valued points of this are. Uh, and we do expect this to be some kind of modular space of G bundles on something. So we want that it's some of the G bundles on some version of the twister P1, some families of the twister P1 parameterized by A. Uh, <clears throat> uh, and maybe at this point you think it's clear what you should do because I mean you just I mean you have the twister p1 and you can just base change it to a but that's definitely not what you want to do so this is definitely this should be different uh, from the base change to a um, because if you would just base change to a you would rather end up seeing g as an algebraic group again but you you want you want something else um, particularly, I like this A lives over the complex numbers, but this base change here should not live over the complex numbers, it should just live over the real numbers. All right, so, so the, the, the key question is what is this thing? What is this family of twister P1s parameterized by this ring A? Uh, by the way, I realize that uh, the questions are not, uh, you don't hear them in the video, so let me repeat them. Uh, so the question uh, was whether you shouldn't rather consider you one equivariant vector bundles here. So this is what would rather correspond to actual variations of hot structures, not the variations of twister structures. Um, the answer is no, I don't want to do that. So again, and again, my first motivation for this comes from studying the PID case. Um, so there is a theory of just G-bundles on the five from 10 curve, and there's a theory of Galois equivariant G-bundles on the five from 10 curve. <clears throat> and if you start with periodic hot structures defined over a finite extension of QP, then you get some kind of Galois equivariant vector bundles on the five from 10 curve. But <clears throat> if you just live, uh, do periodic hot structures over CP, then you just have a bare vector bundle on the five from 10 curve. And it is this kind of geometric version that I want to use. Uh, so I want to get rid of this E1 action. Quick question. Maybe this is to be the setup here, kind of. Is the is the idea that this P1 tilde thing is going to be like the, the real version of a relative far front ten curve? Uh, well, well, yeah. So this this, is, this should be the relative far front ten curve parameterized yeah, by A, so to say. Yeah. So like this category of analytic rings you want to work with are going to be something like the the perfectoid ring. Exactly. So yeah, these A's that I want to allow they should be something like perfectoid rings. Okay. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> All right, so, so we want to uh, figure out what something is, so let's do some measurements. It turns out that there are some non-trivial measurements you can make. <clears throat> Namely, um, we know what the automorphisms of the trivial G-torsor should be as a functor. So there should be this real analytic incarnation of G of R. So, and, I mean, knowing what the automorphisms of the trivial G-tos are, as well as knowing what the global sections of the structure sheet are. Uh, so we know, uh, so the first measurement we can do is that the global sections of this funny family of twist p ones parameterized by A of the structure sheet, this must be equal uh, to, map, to mapping some of the analytic spectrum of uh, of A towards um, this analytic stack RLA. Just because we want G of RLA to be uh, the automorphisms of the trivial G-torsor. I mean, as a modular problem, the internal argument.
All right, so that's some information. Um, here's another kind of measurement one can do where one needs to put in a little bit of further, further insight into what one is looking for. Um, so there, in PEDIC, uh, geometry is the following, the following construction uh, has become quite ubiquitous, um, quite widely used. Uh, whenever you have a coherent sheaf, Uh, let me call it straight E, um, on just the absolute uh, to a step one, so not in the family, <clears throat> you can define the following functor. Um, and in, 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 in periodic geometry, this is called a banach kolm space. Uh, so let me call this a real banach kolm space. Um, uh, so in keeping the tradition, let me call this BC, um, uh, of E, um, which is a moduli space sum of global sections of this E. So this takes any, any A, any such A for which this family of twisted points is defined, uh, and maps it to the global sections of this guy uh, of E, or rather of E base change to this family. But let me not write the base change explicitly. <clears throat> so, uh, in periodic geometry, uh, like, like if we take the structure sheets and this somehow just corresponds to QP, um, if you, however, take uh, the skyscraper sheet at one of these other points, like the CP point, this gives you a skyscraper sheet, and the global sections rather correspond to CP or some of the affine line. And so these bandach kolm spaces periodically they are some kind of mixture of finite dimensional QP vector spaces and finite dimensional CP vector spaces. And because QP and CP are so different, uh, they are very easy to tell apart. Here, these are kind of some mixtures of real vector spaces and complex vector spaces, which is more difficult to, to tell apart. Um, Yes. E, no. It's still some, un this, the dimension is still the same uncountability. Uh, so, so, so it's, it's still a separable Banach space of a QP. So, so, so as an, just as a Banach QP vector space, it actually is, has some kind of finite expression in terms of finite dimensional QP and CP vector spaces, even if it's not CP. But let, please ignore. Uh, um, Right, so you have these things, um, and you can make a guess for what skyscraper sheaves correspond to. Um, so, so consider, consider some point. Uh, of the Falcon tank curve. <clears throat> uh, sorry, of the twist of P1. Um, and, and, and E to be, so this may or may not be uh, the one uh, I chose in the beginning. And let's take E to be just um, the corresponding skyscraper sheaf. Um, <clears throat> then, <clears throat> then one wants the theory to have something to do with this variation of twister structures. And so if you look at variations of twister structures, that's something that happens basically with this twister P1. Well, generically, um, this has something to do with D modules, but then when you are at this given point, rather it has something to do with Higgs modules. Um, and this is something that you want to replicate uh, using this stuff. And so, so the variation, so the expected relation to variations of twister structures Uh, suggests that uh, for I not being the chosen point, uh, <clears throat> the banach kolm space uh, of this guy, 
So, so, so just the underlying, so if you just evaluate this at a point, this would just be the complex numbers, just the global sections of this. Um, but uh, what you would expect is that to see the analytic f on line over the complex numbers as an analytic DRAM, it's an analytic DRAM stack. Because generically, you're meant to see something related to D modules. And so the way we incarnate this is something as, as for the current sheaves on, on this analytic DRAM stack. Uh, but the Banach Comet space for the, this point that we started with should rather be something having to do with Higgs modules. And so there's also a stack related to Higgs modules, um, which is what in Pierre de Koch we call the analytic Koch state stack. Um, analytic Koch state stack. So we take the analytic F in line. So just the complex numbers as a complex manifold and then takes the analytic Koch state stack. So, so this is related to, to Higgs bundles. So let me briefly recall what, what, how this looks like. Uh, uh, so for X, uh, may, maybe any complex manifold, um, <coughs> you can define a hot state stack, uh, see, or analytic hot state stack, <coughs> uh, which maps back to X, <coughs> and which is actually a gerb banded by you take, have the zero section inside of the tangent bundle, and then you take its overconvergent neighborhood. <clears throat> so basically what happens when you take this analytic DRAM stack is that you're kind of taking a quotient of X uh, by this overconvergent neighborhood of the zero section, but where this somehow acts by translations, by non-trivial translations, but when you rescale the translations to act by multiplication by zero, then you're somehow <laughs> trivially killing this thing and then you actually get a gerb. In this case, actually a trivial gerb. Uh, so in the corresponding periodic story, this gerb, gerb is very much non-trivial and related to non-trivial twists appearing in the periodic Simpson correspondence and uh, Anche, Sawyer, Lebra and others uh, have been working on this. Uh, Pan, Rodriguez, Camargo. Um, in the complex case, it's just a trivial gerb. Uh, so this is what you would be expecting to see uh, here. And it turns out that these measurements uh, basically determine everything. So these measurements are sufficient to pin down. Uh, what this thing has to be. So basically the reason is that I mean, you expect it to be some kind of projective thing, so it should be the approach of some gradient ring. So basically, you just have to determine all the global sections of the line bundles of O of N. And those you can somehow inductively understand uh, and somehow build up from just the structure sheaf and, and then some, uh, add some skyscraper sheaves on top of this. This way, it's one way to figure out what this has to be. Um, and it's not quite clear that everything has to be consistent, but it turns out that there is a consistent definition. Um, and so there, there is a direct construction of this uh, available for, for certain A's. Um, <clears throat> so in the PD case, uh, these things have been termed needle perfectoids. And uh, 
Um, so, 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 <clears throat> so what these things will be, they are some kind of uh, extensions of something perfectoid. In this case, something perfectoid means the algebra of continuous functions on a compact host of space. Um, uh, well, <clears throat> this could be some near-potent extension, but you allow something slightly more general. You somehow allow extensions by some radical where the functions are in some very small, so they're smaller than any given number. So, for example, if you look at the overconvergent neighborhood of zero uh, inside of A1, this will be counted as as a some dagger near-potent extension. Of just of just C at the, at the origin. <clears throat> so there's there's some null dagger radical of A. It's it's, it's, it's an ideal of A, um, and and the quotient of A by this null dagger radical is such an algebra of continuous functions. Yeah, so let me let me let me give the formula, yeah. Um, because for these things I will now actually be just able to write it down. So <clears throat> so you want to define something living over the twist of P1. And one way to think about this is that this is some of this covered, this is actually covered by the analytic fn fn line over the complex numbers. Um, <clears throat> uh, Yeah. Um, so I mean, usually, like to cover the p1 of the complex numbers, you would need two copies of the affine line: one one near zero, one near infinity. But when you when you're on the twist of p1, these two get swapped under complex conjugation, anyways. So it's enough to define it on one of the charts, but you still have to de define some descent datum afterwards. <clears throat> and so let's say the coordinate here uh, is some lambda. Um, <clears throat> then. The first thing you can define first is what this fiber product here is. <clears throat> and uh, basically, I mean, up to this issue that I should make lambda, so an intubation from the algebraic version to the analytic version <clears throat> in lambda, um, you just take A adjoin this lambda uh, and then mod out by lambda times a nil radical. So if lambda is non-zero, this means you're just so if you're like on the GM, then you're just modeling out this nil radical and just get this algebra of continuous functions. But when lambda is equal to zero, uh, then yeah, you somehow put instead putting this nil radical one degree higher, which is related to some of the gerb appearing there. Um, right. Uh, so this is this, and then uh, like on, on the analytic GM. Oh, let's see, uh, it descends uh, to the analytic gene. It descends to uh, to R. I mean, you can do the descent, and the reason is that just that the, on there you're basically just getting the quotient of A by this no dagger radical. This is just this algebra of continuous functions on some compact host of space, and this just descends canonically to the continuous real variant functions. All right, so now suddenly also like analytic spaces that correspond to continuous functions uh, also appear. So, so far they didn't appear yesterday, but now also they play a role. All right, so now I have defined some class of analytic rings, which are these, uh, well, peer to these things are called nil perfectoid, and I don't know what to call them. Um, and for these things, one has to find this family of twister P1s, and it satisfies these desiderata. And basically, these desiderata force this definition.
All right. So then one can wonder whether this was any good. Uh, and so in particular, like one can wonder, well, what does the stack bungee actually look like in the simplest case um, uh, for, for the multiplicative group? And it turns out that this is what you would maybe hope. So usually the line bundles are completely classified by the degree. So you would expect that there's a disjoint union over all possible degrees. And once you fix the degree, some of the automorph, there, there's this given one. So you might, would expect that all possible line bundles are somehow you can trivialize them locally uh, if the degree is fixed and this indeed happens. And the automorphisms, well, they should be precisely R star or R star. Um, Okay, and so this is uh, what one was probably hoping for. All right. Thus, the next thing I want to discuss is L parameters. <clears throat> so, what I always found most mysterious uh, in the real local language correspondence is that L parameters are representations of the real way group, continuous representations of them. And these are objects that I've never seen a cohomological origin for. I mean, Hodge structures can be regarded as certain types of representations of the group, but just some certain algebraic ones. I mean, the Hodge, the Hodge numbers must be integral. But if you want arbitrary real way group representations, then you somehow must have a series of something like Hodge structures, but where the Hodge structures are real numbers or complex numbers. And um, this is strange. Um, so let's just, but let's, but in some sense, what I've already told you, like I've already, like now this bungee is completely fixed, right? So there is now the stack bungee. And uh, whatever my geometric Langlands correspondence is, it should be related to the category of particular and chiefs on this bungee to some other spectral side. Uh, okay, so let's, let's figure out what the spectral side has to be. Um, so, <clears throat> so in some sense, these L parameters, they should arise by looking at hack operators on Bungie. So something one can do, uh, which one always does in this kind of geometric language stuff, uh, is one looks at modifications of G bundles. Um, and modifications, they must happen at some point. So somewhere you, somewhere you must parameterize degree one divisors on the curve which parameterize the point of the curve. So this is the second stack. Uh, this would parameterize uh, two G bundles. Uh, and a degree one divisor on the curve. <coughs> and an isomorphism away from, so and E restricted to this thing, minus D is isomorphic to E prime, similarly restricted. <coughs> and then, you have one projection which is just to the E, one projection which is to the E prime, and you can also remember the divisors. <clears throat> now usually, in usual algebraic geometry, the moduli space of degree one divisors on the curve is the curve itself. Not so here. Uh, I mean, this is also a phenomenon that already appears on the Falcon 10 business. So rather, I mean, what is div one? What, what is the moduli space of degree one div Cartier divisors? This is a thing that parameterizes a line bundle in a section where L is a degree one line bundle. And in particular, by the previous theorem, it is completely clear what this should mean. This is just the line bundle which lies in the connected component corresponding to one. Uh, <clears throat> and a section, a global section, a uh, non zero global section. That's the thing. Um, in other words, like locally, uh, locally this thing will be isomorphic to the line bundle O of one. And <clears throat> picking an isomorphism uh, shows that this div one here uh, will be isomorphic to the banach com S space for O of one, because this is what will parameterize these global sections then of O of one. It shouldn't be the zero section, so you better remove that zero section. 
um, and then divide out by, by the automorphism of the trivial bundle, which is just R star LA. <coughs> And uh, like what the, what the second variety will do is, I mean, it will start with some sheaf here, pull it back, and then push it forward, and we'll produce some sheaf on here. And in an ideal real world, this will be some kind of stuff on here, tends it with just some vector bundle on the other side. Uh, so uh, all parameters uh, should be related to vector bundles, or rather G hat bundles. Uh, <clears throat> on this one. Or in fact, it's kind of forced on you that this must be uh, the definition of what an L parameter is. Like, kind of geometric Langlands picture developed in this uh, framework forces on you the definition that uh, L parameters must be G hat bundles on this diff one. All right, so, so let's, let's compute the diff one. Um, so I already gave you some kind of formula for it, um, but there was still this mysterious Banach from S space of O of one appearing. It's something for which I don't yet still have a canonical, completely canonical description, but it's at least non-canonically isomorphic to R realized in the, by this condensed functor. So we have some locally constant functions um, times the affine line over the complex number is realized as a complex analytic thing. Okay, and so this R star X just by translation, so you, you get a description of div one as, yeah, so this R as a condensed thing times the complex analytic affine line, remove the origin, divide out by R star local analytic. And now I don't see what this has to do with the wave group. So that sounds bad, but fortunately there's a different description of the same stack um, where it becomes transparent what this vector bundles on this thing have to do with representations of the real way group. Um, so here's a different description. <clears throat> um, so, so we're parameterizing degree one devices in here, but this has a twofold covering just by the usual projective space of a C. <clears throat> and and locally, you can lift any divisor, any divisor uniquely to P one over C. And you can also do some families, right? I mean, you can just pull back this picture to, to families and then you get some funny funny version of P1's parameters by A also, and any divisor can be locally lifted. Um, and so this means that this div one, that's really some kind of div one for the real numbers, you can also think of as a div one somehow for the complex numbers instead, where you parameterize degree one divisors here, but there are always two choices of doing this. So you need to mod out by the Galva group in the end. <clears throat> and then the step one for C has a very analogous description, but now in terms of degree one line bundles on this P1C, uh, but there's some kind of degree shift uh, happening. So this Div1C, if you use, somehow use the same idea as there, it will come out as a Banach-Comet space now for the degree 
thing that's of degree two on here, but really comes well, push forward from a line bundle on upstairs, mod zero mod C star locally analytic. <clears throat> and now the Banach comest space for over half actually has a much more friendly description. Um, you can compute that and it turns out to be just a two dimensional uh, plane as a complex analytic space. I mean, you do these computations, I mean, just by writing these vector bundles in terms of some short exact sequence in the structure sheaf and these skyscraper sheaves, and then, yeah, just playing around. I mean, <clears throat> um, and, and so, yeah, so you, you get a different description that div one or div one R, um, it's also this, the quotient of this thing that you get for the complex numbers by another action of the Gower group. And these two quotients, they precisely combine to give a quotient by the real way group. So this is exactly uh, the two dimensional complex plane as a complex analytic space. Remove the origin, modulo the real way group as a real analytic group. Okay, so finally we have our real way group there. Um, by the way, uh, uh, acting on this here, you really have the quaternions acting, and inside there, you somehow have the real way group. Um, why does the, do the quaternions act? That's just because the automorphisms of this O of a half, they're precisely the quaternions. More or less because you constructed this thing as a browser very, very variety. <clears throat> and so this is how the real way group acts, acts here. <clears throat> and now, and now, if you look at just vector bundles on this div one, <clears throat> then, I mean, here we have some kind of two-dimensional complex analytic thing. I and mean, if it was really the algebraic one, then we would know that all the vector bundles on here, they extend canonically to vector bundles on the whole affine plane. And this turns out to also happen here. There's a small analytic thing you have to check. But it turns out that these are just the same uh, as vector bundles on the full. Uh, A2 analytic module of the real way group. In geometric labyrinth, the cell parameters would be something like, would be flat plus. Uh, well, no, because here I'm using quasi coherent sheaves on Bungie as my kind of sheaf theory. I also get quasi coherent sheaves here. So I do end up getting yeah, vector bundles. Um, and now this is very transparently related to vector bun, uh, to representations of, of the of the real way group, uh, because I mean, if you have one, then you can just pull it back and do the induced vector bundle. And if you have something here, you can take the fiber at zero. And these are at least this writes this as some kind of retract here. And I think you can. <laughs> and this is something you need to double check whether really uh, all of them are isomorphic to ones coming from the image. But at least there's an extremely close relation. Right. So. By the way, the isomorphism between this description of div one and that description over there, I once tried to write it down, but uh, it's very confusing. <laughs> um, right. Here's some chalk. Yeah. All right. So uh, this is uh, how is this? The real way group shows up. All right. Um, right, and then, then, yeah. And then, in particular, the modular space of L parameters will just be some of the modular space of G hat bundles on, on this diff one. Uh, now, in a much more naive sense, so really, uh, you, you send any A. Two G check bundles. Hey, over one G check bundles. On this div one, just base really now base change from C to A. 
<clears throat> um, right. And I don't know how this is really related to the modular space that Vogan defined. I do believe that for GL2, one can write down non like interesting maps from Vogan's modular spaces towards uh, this stack. Uh, but uh, I don't want to claim I understand at all how the general relation works. Yeah, 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 yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, so, right. So uh, let, let me. <clears throat> now. So another thing I promised this was a new perspective on variations of twister structures. So let me now explain a little more precisely how this is related to uh, twister structures. <clears throat> so another construction that one likes to do in periodic geometry is the following. Um, if one has some rich analytic variety, so now instead has a complex analytic space, um, <clears throat> Uh, there is this thing that's called uh, usually S diamond that one can also define here, which will live over the stiff one. Um, and let me explain what this is maybe on the next board. Um, right. So uh, S, S diamond is a thing that takes um, any, any such A uh, to uh, such a degree one Cartier divisor. Plus, plus a map from, from this Cartier divisor to S. Uh, so in periodic geometry, one thinks of these Cartier divisors as different untils and then map from the until to S, that's what the S diamond is. Um, <clears throat> so this lives over this one. And <clears throat> actually the way this happens is, uh, and the way some of the construction worked, uh, is that if, generically if D somehow stays away from this point I infinity, uh, this will end up being the analytic drum stack. So generically, uh, the fibers are the analytic drum stack. Um, but then there is this fiber over uh, some of the fixed uh, Cartier divisor that we uh, are infinity. Uh, <clears throat> this will be this analytic hot state stack. <clears throat> and so this means that the vector bundles uh, on this S diamond they're very closely related to the variations of twister structure because these are also uh, similar things. Except that actually the theory over a point got changed because over a point we here got something that was related to arbitrary representations of the real way group. And this is not something one sees in the twister picture. <laughs> and so the relation is that actually you can kind of pass the projective spaces there in this A2 and then get instead such a quotient of this twist of P1 by here. And then actually this is already defined as a pullback of something here. And if instead you took a pullback, if you ignore the real way group action and took a pullback here, then you get something here. And this picture is, is a usual picture. Uh, but it is equivalent on the real way group, which actually just acts via a quotient to U1. And so you have see the usual U1 equivariant twister structure somewhere here, and but then you pull it back to a different one here. Uh, it is a bit confusing, but anyways.
So these are the two variations of twisted structures. All this. <clears throat> um, another thing that I mentioned in the first lecture was this. <clears throat> so I mentioned this, this isomorphism between Lubin Tate and Rinfeld Tower in the periodic case, um, which. Uh, Uh, which is nowadays understood as being coming from under, looking at the moduli space of injections uh, from O squared to O over half um, on the Falk von Ten curve. Um, and <clears throat> now you can you can do the same thing now in this story. Uh, so here this uh, gives you the following picture. So you can look at the moduli space, which is really just the moduli space of injective maps from O squared to O over half. Uh, on on this family of twister p one parametroids by a. Um, <clears throat> any such map will have as co kernel some degree one Cartier divisor. So this space lives over diff one. <clears throat> uh, where you're just parametrizing where where the modification happens, and then you can decide. How you want to unravel this picture? So let's unravel this picture by starting, say, here. Um, then the to give to determine this guy, you first have to determine which modification of O squared this is. Uh, this is somehow determined by a point in P1 at this divisor, and so the way this unravels means that you actually get uh, the diamond associated to P1C on top of this, and it maps to here, uh, where this parameterizes the modification you do, uh, and and uh, sorry, I screwed up my explanation because, uh, sorry. And <clears throat> a priori, uh, P1, but if you want the modification to be isomorphic to O over half, you should stay away from the real points of the P1. So you just get the upper and lower half plane. And once you are on the upper and lower half plane, this thing is isomorphic to O over half, but not yet, you didn't yet pick an isomorphism. And so picking the isomorphism gives you a torso uh, for the, Unit, uh, invertible quaternions. <clears throat> uh, and you can also uh, analyze the picture the other way around. So you can look at this bundle as fixed and look at which modification this is. Then this is also determined by, uh, uh, first the modification determined by a point of P1. So you map to P1C uh, diamond. <clears throat> and now, uh, all modifications actually happen to be isomorphic to O squared, but you need to still pick the isomorphism, so you just get a GL to R LA torso on top. Okay, and so this is really, uh, this is in terms of the piece uh, of the Hacker stack for GL2, what we're looking at here. <clears throat> some moduli space of modifications of rank two bundles on, on, on this twister P1. <clears throat> um, so in principle, all these things can be more or less explicitly written down. I mean, this one, I give you a description. This, I also give you some kind of description what it generally is, and then, but, uh, I can't wrap my head around really what explicitly happens here anymore. Um, still, <clears throat> um, a different way to write uh, part of the same picture is that you get a map, like having this torso over here uh, means that you have a map from P1C uh, diamond towards the classifying stack of GL2 R LA. <clears throat> uh, but actually, some of there is this commuting action of the quaternion, so actually you get a map from uh, the quotient here by the invertible quaternions, this really maps there. <clears throat> and then this again maps down uh, to div one and the classifying space 
of <clears throat> of H star is a local energy group. And maybe really this is a piece uh, of the hacker stack because this is a piece of the stack of rank two bundles. This is also a piece of the stack of rank two bundles. And now I've really written a piece of, the, of this uh, hacker correspondence. And so what a hacker operator would then do is, I don't know, let's give again names to these maps, F and G, is it would take a sheaf here, pull it back and push it forward. <clears throat> and this is precisely the operation that I alluded to in the first lecture. So if pi is a dual to R LA representation, uh, so dual to representation in the sense that I'm talking about, so as a sheaf on here, um, then you can t uh, pull it back and push, in, uh, push forward, where pushing forward uh, is like taking cohomology. So. Um, pi somehow first it corresponds to a sheaf uh, there, but then if you pull it back, it's some kind of H star equivariant variation of twister structures. on this P1, some infinite dimensional, all the stalks are equal to this pi, and then the upper star of the lower star of it corresponds to its cohomology. <clears throat> and then this is one of what gives you this uh, cohomological realization of air printers that I talked about in the first lecture that um, if pi is a discrete series, representation of GL2, <clears throat> then doing this operation, so someone treating pi as this h star equivariant variation of twister structures on P1 and then taking its cohomology, uh, <clears throat> this is up to shifts and twists um, on the diff one factor precisely the local Langer's correspondence for pi, and then on the h star factor precisely the Jackie Langer's correspondence for pi. And okay, I guess I'm out of time, so let me stop here. So I think earlier on you said something like the compact house group space in front of the analog factory space. That's right, yeah. Mm -hmm. The question was well, why the compact hostel space or the analog of perfectoid spaces. And um, <clears throat> well, you know, I'm mean, like general perfectoid spaces, they can always be covered by the strictly totally disconnected guys, which are just like pro finite sets of complete algebraic closed extensions of QP. Um, but the Gelfand Mesa theorem tells you that over the complex numbers, there are no further complete algebraic closed extensions. So you can just have pro finite sets of copies of the complex numbers. And then, okay, if you allow also some quotient of profile sets, you get the compact host of one. So. Hello? Hello? Is there a relationship to the Matsushima problem? Thanks for asking. Uh, <laughs> um, Could you repeat the question? Yes, I will. Uh, so the question is what, what, so I also promised something about the Matsushima formula. By the way, I mean, like, Another thing I promised was uh, uh, Langdon's duality conjecture, but now, I mean, you just have all the ingredients there. Yeah? You have this other side, Langdon's dual side, and then you just write down the obvious conjecture. Um, and, and maybe it's not completely out of reach to at least construct the spectral action, but uh, uh, I didn't seriously start investigating that. Right, about the Matsushima formula. Um, so here's a suspicion I always had. on that on some incarnation of the Shimura variety, um, <clears throat> so Shimura variety, there, there, there's some uh, reductive group G and then, I don't know, um, <clears throat> uh, the mission symbolic domain X. Um, but something that you always get from this datum is also uh, a G prime over R, which is like a compact mod center in a form. And um, uh, I always suspected that 
on some incarnation of the Shimura variety, there is a canonical uh, uh, G prime R, maybe LA, I don't know. Uh, it's also a top. Um, the reason for the suspicion is that uh, I, I do expect moduli spaces of more varieties to be secretly moduli spaces of Stukas over number fields. And you can then specialize such a Stuka to a local Stuka at all the finite places. And then it somehow has this related to the usual torsos you know for like the adelic group. Um, oh, so finite adelic group, um, trivializing like, like the Tate module of elliptic curves or something like this. Um, but you can also get a local Stuka at the real numbers. And so this is some kind of twister cohomology that should exist. And trivializing this twister cohomology should be precisely uh, giving you such a G prime of R torso. Um, and at least over like the, the real part of the picture, I can now substantiate that uh, because uh, uh, again, of this picture there. <clears throat> so if you left the upper and lower half plane, um, then by this picture there, this maps to the classifying stack of uh, H star. But this is actually, again, GL2R equivariant. Uh, and maybe if you don't care about the full GL to R, but just for some uh, congruent subgroup gamma, then you can also map this quotient there. <clears throat> and so um, something you can do then is you can get some kind of analog of completed cohomology at, so it also still maps to diff one, um, at, the, at, the, at the, the complex place. Uh, so you can somehow enrich the cohomology of your Shimur variety uh, by somehow taking F lower star of O and get something which is something on the one, so it gives you some kind of veil group representation, but there's also some H star representation. So this has, roughly speaking, this corresponds to some veil group of R times H star representation. <clears throat> and what is this? So uh, if you pick a, the isotipping component for some representation of H star, which is basically just an algebraic representation of GL2, uh, then the corresponding isotipic piece will be precisely the thing that, I mean, there's a standard way of taking an algebraic representation of GL2 and producing some cohomology group of the Shmuel variety, which is somehow treated using gamma uh, and build a local system. And this will precisely what this will be, but some as a, a Hodge theoretic incarnation of it. Uh, corresponding structure there, um, right? So you can, the item one, you can upgrade the cohomology of Shimura, right? So the, the, the hot structure part, uh, in some sense to, to have an extra part, which is a representation of this compact quad center inner form. And the second thing is that you can give a formula for what this is, uh, namely, uh, well, we, we had something else that was producing something here, some, some, some particular and chiefs on here, which was to start with something here and then do this pack operator kind of procedure, pull back and push forward. And uh, turns out that this is actually the same thing as applying uh, this, uh, sorry, let me call this thing like H, um, as applying this, uh, this, this funny functor, uh, to just the space of automorphic forms on, on gamma. Like this, automorphic forms on GL2R of gamma, uh, regarded as a representation of GL2R, right? So you have the automorphic forms on GL2R mod gamma, it's a GL2R representation, you can put it here, and then just apply this functor and it will produce for you uh, the cohomology of the Shinobi. And that's some incarnation of the Matsushima formula. 
And it's actually the way I know how to prove this currently. So I'm basically globalizing my discrete series representation and then using that. Uh, so, so the interaction between the L parameters for discrete series and principal series? Uh, uh, yeah. Um, <clears throat> so basically what one can construct an interesting map from a P1 mod GM into this stack of rank two bundles there, uh, which uh, the generic point uh, maps to um, the discrete series guy. And the special points um, to, 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 to principal series one. And basically, I mean, this space is basically the one that Logan considers in this case. Um, uh, how do you do it? Well, uh, uh, and one way to think about it is that you start with a special point. Um, there you just get a direct sum of two characters. But it turns out that you can compute the X through between those two characters, and there's a non trivial X. So you get to get a map from A1 towards this, or really A1 mod GM, uh, which is looking at the X class between the two. And it turns out that as a vector bundle on this band two, uh, this becomes generically isomorphic to the, the discrete series L parameter. Uh, critical here for making this possible is that this equivalence between vector bundles on the phone and on the full affine plane is not exact. So this extension that you see away from the origin doesn't extend to an extension at the origin. So somebody can get something suddenly new at the origin. And you do that. 